Hello and welcome to the Breaking Muscle podcast. As ever, I'm your host, Tom McCormick, and today I am delighted to be joined by Tom Purvis. Tom is the creator of RTS and exerciseprofessional.com. He's also the trainer of trainers. Tom has a huge amount of uh, experience in educating fitness professionals to deliver uh, better quality of service to their clients and more efficient training. Now, he is a mentor to one of my coaches, one of the people I go to to upskill myself, Michael Goulden, who is a former guest on the show, but he is also a mentor to Ben Bukulski, top IFBB pro bodybuilder. So he has seen uh, a whole host of things, been in the industry for years and years, trained in uh, Gold's Gym, uh, the Gold's Gym, back in the glory days where all the bodybuilders were there working out. Anyway, today we pick his brains and go a deep dive on Uh, all things training efficiency and how you can improve your gains in muscle mass and the thought process. Really, it's about getting your thought process in place to maximize your potential and build as much muscle as possible and what goes into that. It's a fascinating discussion, so I will stop talking at you and I will let Tom uh, give us his wisdom. Yes, well, so good to finally speak to you. Thank you for taking the time to to have a chat today. Um, I, I wanted to talk, one of the things was training efficiency I wanted to cover. We'll have to do podcast efficiency as well but um uh get, get get things cracking in a minute how how are things for you you uh you pretty busy over there always it's always something to do yep yeah 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 and what about the state of play as as general i mean uh i think as you said you said to michael you know things are pretty tough over here what what what's what's happening over there at the moment you know it, it's so different from From location to location, from state to state. Mm-hmm. I mean, I can't speak for everybody. Certainly, even when they say that our state is on the rise, it's pretty much like most places in universities and bars. <laughs> so if you're not in either one of those, you pretty much don't know it exists. Right. You know? Yeah, I think that's not, not too dissimilar to here. Uh, I just got a little bit of, uh, I could hear myself there. Oh, it's gone. I could get get a bit of echo there. Um, yeah. Here, let, I, me, uh, let me plug in my headphones and see if I can still hear you. Okay, cool. My yeah. computer was acting like it couldn't recognize my headphones earlier, but let uh, me see. Okay, okay. Uh, we're, we're, we're flying with technology today, both of us. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Ah, it works. Uh, and uh, no, no uh, echo. No echo. That's perfect. That's great. We, we can definitely go with that. Um, I've just got the got the guys doing building work next door. Obviously, typically, uh, they've, that now's the time. Um, in, ter- <laughs> in terms of what I wanted to chat about today, I thought just generally, um, well, obviously, you know, using your wisdom and insight and things, but basically helping people to maybe uh, think. Uh, improve their thinking about their training perhaps and I'm sure that that's a pretty broad subject and we'll go on different tangents or whatever but um, you know what one of those topics I definitely want to talk about is tr- sort of training effic- efficiency but um, you know keep it fairly fluid and you know wherever the stories or the anecdotes or the, or the thought processes that you have um, take us I, I'm, I'd lo- love to go there and explore those as long as that's that sounds good to you let's see what happens okay Brilliant. Um, Remember my uh, my topic of uh, well, if there was such a thing as expertise, my topic is exercise mechanics. So I'll be biased that way as opposed to yes, absolutely, yeah, yeah. Any I mean, specific discussion of time sets, reps, rest time, all that stuff is someone else's domain. Sure. Um, yeah, absolutely. Wanted to take a tackle it from that uh, exercise mechanics, uh, the execution sort of angle um, to a large degree, but also if we view it through the lens of people that are looking for hypertrophy and how, and how we apply things and how that, that may or may not change, um, based on individuals and, and their goals and et cetera. But if we view things through that lens, that would be kind of like how I'd like to approach things. Sounds good. It's, and that's, I appreciate that so much because so many times this happens, gosh, constantly, this is the rare occasion where someone actually defines a goal. Yeah. Usually people just start talking about exercise. And in this case, they would talk about efficiency and then they would just take off running. And it's like, well, wait a minute, what are we trying to accomplish here? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know? And so um, I, I see that from so-called experts, these people that are out there saying they provide the best education and all this stuff. And it's like, they never once say, 
well, for this specific population or this specific demographic or these specific goals, and they just act like everyone is them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, absolutely. And and that's such a huge mistake. So so thank you for that clar clarity. There. No no problem at all. Yes, well, actually, it's, yeah. I mean, I was on a, on a call with Michael yesterday and, um, yeah, that yeah that whole process of you know you got first you got to ask you know, you know sort of who who the client is and um and then what their goals are and, and that feeds into everything so I'm, uh, I'm sure we can explore that but uh another point i'm well i'll probably raise this during the conversation is i feel like uh the 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 process or the, the learning journey is first of all you have no idea what works then you will find out what works for you and you tell everyone that's what they must do and then eventually you get to the point of oh no there were some principles <coughs> that helps work that meant that worked for me, but those how I apply those principles to you might be slightly different because you're not me. Uh, and, and and sadly, it's it's taken quite a long time for me to sort of think that process through. Well, I think an interesting thing also, and all of this that we're saying now, while it may seem like wow, I wish they would get to the topic, <laughs> this is this is integral and key to the topic, and it is um, in in concert with what you just mentioned. What works for me. Number one, as soon as someone stumbles on to something that appears to generate some response within them that they're hoping for, that um, doesn't mean it's A, the best way, or B, sustainable. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, may, we may find that because someone that is 22 and incredibly high tolerance for poor mechanics – um, genetically, orthopedically, whatever you want to call it, um, what they're doing may be working to stimulate the change they're hoping for, but that doesn't mean it's going to be sustainable because <clears throat> the worst injuries, in my opinion, are not the muscle tears. They're not the pec tears. They're the long-term insidious growing under the surface of the ocean type of things that generate arthritis and everybody's going, oh, arthritis is for old people. Arthritis is based upon wear and tear, and we are speeding it up with exercise. There are lots of MDs or uh, sports medicine guys will talk about running, and while I'm not of the mindset that these things are in naturally inherent to exercise, I think so much of it, when we're talking about force slash time-based issues, that's based upon across time, how the forces are applied. So they talk about running and they say, well, you, you know, you're going to have 90 year old knees when you're 40 because of your, the way you're doing this. And it's like, wait, you know, that's a generalization. But the idea is, is relatively true that if we take joints, which are never considered really much in exercise on the order of never, and it put forces through them in a manner that they currently can tolerate, people can tolerate American football for quite a few years, but nobody retires at 65 <laughs> from American football. And there's a reason for that. It's not just loss of skill. It's usually an inability to walk. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yes. So I, if there's one thing I'd like to consider, you know, they've talked forever. This, I don't know if it's real research or, or something somebody made up, but they took some Olympic athletes supposedly, and I've heard this my whole life. So who knows? Um, and said, if we gave you a drug that would guarantee you'd win a gold medal tomorrow and it would kill you five years from now, would you take it? Now? And supposedly they all said yes, or mm -hmm, exclusive, mm -hmm. or most of them are, well, I, I, would, I could see why all of them would, because that's their whole life at that point. And we're typically pretty short lived. So there's a thing that I want to keep in mind going back to the who that you mentioned is yes. um, you may be willing to do that, but if you're helping someone, um, I think we have a responsibility to go above and beyond the stupid crap we might experiment with upon ourselves. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, I, for example, loved, love, love, love front squats for lots of emotional reasons. Number one, you typically <laughs> keep doing what you're good at. And certainly there's, you know, the, if there's a response you want, that doesn't mean it's always sustainable. Mm -hmm. And if it's not sustainable, then the goal you were searching for no longer gets satisfied. Yes. So does this thing over time tear us up? Is it for everybody? And was there even an, a, a similarly adequate or even better way to achieve that goal than what we thought we had? Oh, wow, I'm, I'm making progress. Well, that's fantastic. But is there still yet a better way? But because we got our first level of response we were looking for, we just stopped looking. Mm -hmm. So there's an and, and And is it one thing or 
six months from now is that thing that it seems to be making creating the response you want could could it wane in terms of its effect and may may there besides just adding more weight or doing something more severe in terms of stupidity could there be a more reasonable way to to continue that progress or simply something appropriately different mm -hmm. so anyway mm -hmm. you know you still now we actually are leading towards the topic now believe it or not people listening <laughs> <This is laughs> the idea of efficiency so you probably have some specific questions. I've made some notes that I want to bring up along the way. Sure. But uh, sure. I'll shut up. I'll shut up now for a minute, which is always tough for me. I'll <laughs> let you direct this thing as as I should. No problem at all. Well, I mean, people are here wanting to listen to you, to you, not me. Uh, my wife's usually in the other room listening uh, to these podcasts and then uh, tells me that I, I talk too much. So I'll, I'll try and be brief and get you back on. But um, as, as I said earlier, we're looking at through this the lens of someone who's looking uh, to, to develop muscle mass. They, they're looking for hypertrophy. So what's your thought process? What, you know, how, how do you, from, from sort of the thousand mile view, uh, starting out and then zooming into the, the minutia, um, what makes something an effective exercise for someone uh, to, to, to elicit hypertrophy? And how, and how do we differentiate from one exercise to the other, perhaps, taking that individual into account? I'm just making some notes here. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to start with a general term. Mm hmm and I, we're going to have to find some way of clarifying it with greater detail. But let's say, let's forget the word exercise for a minute as much as we can <clears throat> and realize that the point of exercise is not to exercise for the hypertrophy-oriented goal. Mm -hmm. Some people say, oh, you can get a great workout doing X, you know, flopping these battle ropes, ropes around. Well, that's popular. And it's cool, and it's a cheap piece of equipment, so it's economical, and it makes you tired, but is tired equal hypertrophy? So what's a great workout? To me, a great workout, you know, you mentioned efficiency. I'm going to step back for a second, and this is going to be a giant rambling mess of words that I wish you could edit the order in, but <laughs> let's see if somebody gets something out of it. I want to step back for a second. I want to separate efficiency from effectiveness. What we're trying to do is stimulate a specific change. There's pretty much, and I'm going to overstep my quote unquote expertise boundaries, my scope, pretty much impossible to get just one change. So it is very likely that while a hypertrophy oriented stimulation may not be the best way to get stronger, you're likely to get stronger. Mm -hmm. And honestly, while people think these are separate things because the stupid textbooks tell us so, it's really tough not to gain endurance to some degree when we gain strength. Now, someone would say, oh, you mean if I do a bench press or a squat, I'm going to be able to run a marathon better? No, those are very specific skills and extremes. But without a doubt, if you weigh 200 pounds and you get to where your legs are so strong that 200 pounds is insignificant, you can move that 200 pounds longer. Mm -hmm. yes. Your endurance, you see what I mean? So there's a general non-specific to an activity type of overlapping effect of these things. Um, it is entirely possible for a, an untrained person to start doing something over an extended period of time, maybe 20 minutes, and actually watch their quadriceps grow. While we wouldn't consider 20 minutes of riding a stationary bicycle to be hypertrophy-oriented for maybe you or I, Someone who's never done anything by the simple nature of now doing something is liable to generate a level of hypertrophy. So we need to be really clear on that. And, and are we talking about extremes? So effectiveness and efficiency is where I wanted to go. Mm -hmm. The effectiveness of the stimulation versus efficiency. I've had people tell me, oh, I think those are the same things. I mean, well, that's lovely for you, but you're wrong. <laughs> because, uh, you know, we, we love to think we're right because we think a certain thing. One plus one is nine, and I think that's wonderful for somebody, but it's incorrect. And so um, effectiveness is simply is the goal accomplished. So if you have nine things to do today, Tom, and you, <clears throat> you go out and – uh, you traverse the city back and forth to accomplish these things, but you 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 know you go to the west side of the city for one, you go back to the east side of the city, you go back and forth like that all day long, and you accomplish your things. That was not very efficient. While it was entirely effective because goals accomplished one hundred percent. Yes. So 
let's put this in terms of exercise. Someone comes along and says, you know, from, <clears throat> and I don't know how much this still exists because I try my best to, to um, stay far away from the cesspool of social media and, and going clear back to the original social media in my mind, which was Muscle and Fitness Magazine. Um, disinformation is what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. um, well, you got to do 17 back exercises because you got to hit it from all angles. Well, there's a lot of people who got really huge doing that, but there's also a lot of people who, who I got really huge chopping wood. And so, <laughs> you know, is that, is that the best way to accomplish it? Just because it occurred back to our original premise there, but it, we have to consider that while it's been effective, were those exercises so mechanically inefficient that there could have been a more efficient way? Could sp specific design and execution have eliminated that down to where two exercises accomplished the same thing? Mm -hmm. And people would go, there's no way. And I would argue that there's no way for them to know that because <laughs> they have never, ever, ever experimented with that. And it's, it's completely asinine to say something's impossible when we've never ever ever no 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 i did two exercises once and i got smaller i mean you did it one workout and you got smaller wow what were you doing were you comatose the rest of the time i mean it's that what we're doing is talking it's so much in the exercise world almost a hundred percent uh that's an exaggeration we're talking about a belief system more often than not we're not talking about realities and uh realities uh in concert with DNA, which overrides everything. You can take someone built, of course, to be a, a consummate marathon runner, uh, orthopedically, muscularly, and everything else. And while they will hypertrophy to some degree, they will not be Ben Pakulski ever. Mm -hmm. yes. And people want to think that's not true. But um, in some, oh, well, this person got bigger. Now we're back to degrees. They're unlikely to win the Sandow Trophy at the Mr. Olympia contest. Mm -hmm. So... Um, so there's several things there we keep coming back to effectiveness versus efficiency. The back thing is a great example. The chest thing is a great example. I'm going to work my inner versus outer, my upper, middle, lower, and all this kind of stuff. It's like, how exactly would you exclude? How would you exclude portions of that in order to focus on other portions? And by the way, here's what we'd have to do. We'd have to take some, because by, you know, I moved to California in 1987, not that I live there now. Uh, for some, one reason, as I was ending my interest in bodybuilding, I wanted to go out there and work out at the Gold's Gym, mm -hmm. where at that point in time, every professional bodybuilder, with the exception of two, trained. It was that tight yes. and small of a community. Well, here's what I, th I thought, my God, this is going to be great. I'm going to watch all these guys. I'm going to know everything. I just go in the gym for literally four to five hours at night and just train and then watch everybody come in. And here's one thing I found across uh, months and months and months and months and months and months of being there. Everybody did the same thing across time. <laughs> yes. So when they, on a given day, and who knows, they don't write their own articles for these magazines, right? So when they go, oh, the best exercise for for inner chest is X. Well, it's always the same one people say for inner chest. But the bottom line is that here's something that I never saw one time. I never saw anybody only do that proverbial inner chest exercise at the exclusion of all the others just to find out if they could create like a dorsal fin. <laughs> yeah. You know, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's like, um, I, I don't know. Uh, it just... I think dorsal is the wrong word, actually. What's the other one? I don't know. <laughs> An anterior fin, right? right? You know, the center of your pecs being the only thing that grew. Yes. That has never, ever, ever happened. First of all, nobody's done any specific exercise to the exclusion of others that was supposed to be an, uh, a, a muscular region isolating thing. Secondly, you can look at all the science, which is not always directly applicable to exercise and exercise response. You can look at that and say, well, there's virtually no way that could happen because although there are non-spanning fibers, there's no evidence that they exist within the pec. It's a relatively short muscle compared to the sartorius or the semitendinosus, et cetera. And even if those non-spanning fibers were congregated at one end of, or the, of the muscle or the other, it boils down to neurological control. If the motor units are such that 
They both contract at the same time. Can you segregate them in terms of motor units? Can you only get inner versus outer to, to be con, um, stimulated to contract? And if you did, how would you get any get your arm to move? Because uh, so there's a long, 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 long thing there that extends beyond belief systems. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So um, those things that we've done, and, and here's a bigger thing. How would you focus, go back to mechanics finally, how would you focus the force, the resistance? The resistance is the stimulation. Physics is the stimulation. How would you focus that just on one end of the muscle or the other? It's an impossibility mm -hmm. because yeah. the resistance is applied throughout. So these things make it so, listen, is that thing you're doing for an inner chest exercise and this other thing you're doing for an outer chest exercise, is that simply a waste of time to some degree? I mean, maybe it's overall stimulating and you don't know it. But is it in and of itself, despite its sensation to you, is it really effective? Could we have spent more time looking at fiber, plane of the fibers, which we can look at in fan-shaped muscles, and, and then direction of resistance and motion in response to that? And one of the things people absolutely do not seem to get is the direction of resistance, not the motion. The direction of resistance determines what's influenced. Mm -hmm. People will stand up. Here's a great example of, of lack of efficiency due to lack of effectiveness. They'll stand up while well, you can probably see me. They can't. I'm going to do this thing that you'll see in group exercise where they're standing and they'll grab some dumbbells. And while standing, they'll do what looks like a fly machine. You follow me? Yeah. And so with that in mind, they're going, oh, it's a chest exercise. Well, they're saying it's a chest exercise because they think the motion is produced by the chest. The motion is only produced by the chest if the resistance is fighting that motion. And right in that specific exercise, a quote unquote standing fly with dumbbells, the resistance is pulling downward. So I don't care how you're moving, the things that are pulling upward within you are what's getting stimulated, right? So this is a problem with the idea of train motions, not muscles. Number one, what moves you? It's always muscle. Number two, the muscle that's, re that's really working is the one that's directly opposed by resistance. I don't care how you're moving. Mm -hmm. So that is such a, that is such a mechanical inaccuracy on the order of one plus one equals three to say that it's all about movement. Yes. Now I'm not saying it's not about the influence of movement also, but in concert with direction of resistance mm -hmm, mm -hmm. movement has nothing to do with moving. It has to do with shortening and lengthening of specific tissues that are being challenged by specific directions of resistance. Mm -hmm. You want yes. to talk about efficiency. One of the keys to efficiency is going to be the rate at which you start and stop. People talk about speed of a rep, and I'm going to go one notch further and say the speed of the rep is mildly interesting. Far more interesting is how that affects or how more, much more specific you should be with how you start the rep and how you stop the rep. People somehow think that faster is more important, and we're going to step outside of the world of sports right now, and we're going to talk specifically about hypertrophy. We could argue. Now, realize every single thing that I'm going to say we might want to get away from Tons of people have done to get big. And those people are likely to, it's likely that they're going to get big no matter what. Mm -hmm. The question is always, and I always use Ben Pakulski as an example, because he's one of, one of the um, myth challenging guys. He, he, while he was obviously making enough progress to, to head towards competing in the Olympia, it appears for the years I've known him, eight years now that he's always asked, but is there something I've left on the table? Is there something else I could do? Is there something else I'm doing that's not so effective and I could substitute those things or maybe do them in addition? I don't know. And one of those things is how you start and stop the thing. This is one of the most difficult things to get people to change. They launch the load because they think it's all about moving the weight. What it's really about is contracting and having the weight appropriately challenge the contraction. And there's a big difference between just moving load, which is not the goal we brought up. It's a goal for somebody out there, but not what you're mentioning. Moving weight doesn't guarantee quality contraction. When a weight is launched, inertial effects are created. And I do on my uh, on my courses, I, I 
have on uh, educate, um, exerciseprofessional.com. There's a course, uh, Resistance Mechanics 2 or something like that, I can't remember. We talk about inertial effects and we get out a tensiometer, i.e. a fishing scale, and we'll put a five pound weight on there and move it at different rates. And really it's not about two seconds up, three seconds up, it's not about that. It's about rates of acceleration and deceleration. So I can take that five pounds and move it in a manner where it, the scale shows five pounds the entire time. It doesn't take much to start moving that thing. In fact, what most people would call slow starts to change that five. <clears throat> so as I'm going up and down, that five pound weight is, is <clears throat> well, if I go fast enough, it's 20 pounds at the bottom when I decelerate it. It's zero through the bulk of the range if I launch it. So you're telling me we went and grabbed five pounds, 10 pounds, 100 pounds for the purpose of having entirely different loads on us than the one we grabbed. And you, everybody's hollering about full range of motion. Wake up, people. Number one, there's no such thing as full range of motion. More is not better. Exceeding a joint's capabilities doesn't mean that it's full. It means it's excessive. And you can never get full range of motion for a contraction because in most cases, the joints and muscle shortening and lengthening moves far further than you can maintain resistance through a range. And those words don't mean much to most people. We'd have to do some kind of visual with that. But I'm just telling you, if you think you ever went full range of motion because you went as low as you could in a bench press, with your hands on that bar, you didn't get halfway to full shortening. So is it necessary? Do we need another exercise for that? Quite possibly. But realize you get big anyway. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, so how much would we get by adding more to that? I can't promise you anything. All I can say is, like Ben Pakulski thinks, is there anything we're leaving on the table? And usually we're leaving quite a bit when we just move weight. And more at one end does not satisfy the inadequacy at the other end. So... Um, yeah, that, uh, that truth that when we're moving fast, that weight we've chosen is only stimulating through about 50% or less of the range of motion. And here's the thing. I'm not saying good or bad because whoever's listening, I don't care about you. I'm not telling anybody what to do. I gave up my exercise professional codependency 30 years ago. I'm simply stating facts. You can go do whatever you want, and you can go back to what we said in the beginning, Tom, where we said, oh, but I'm getting results. That's great. If you're perfectly happy with everything that's going on and you find that it's sustainable, absolutely do whatever the hell you want. Mm -hmm. But if you want to know the truth about stimulating muscle efficiently, then we need to consider that all of these exercises that are very traditional are because there's a limited direction of resistance provided, that there's a limited range through which it's effective because of either how the exercise is designed, i.e. the exact direction of resistance, or we've launched it. So it's, wow. So you're throwing this dumbbell press around. It's doing nothing at the top. So we feel the need to go over and grab some cables and do a cable crossover. I understand because each one is half of a rep. No matter how far you move, it's only half loaded. So you want to tell, oh, I need this. And one does inner and one does mass. And one does, it's okay, number one, get rid of those things that you just made up and you memorized. Number two, realize that those two exercises, and I'm not saying they need to be put into one. I'm just saying if they could be with a specific device, provided with appropriate resistance, meaning a resistance profile that goes up or goes down in concert with our strength profile changes. A strength profile, while it's very, very rare that anybody distinguishes between the two, a strength profile is the simple fact that your muscles within you are creating torque. And I know we always talk about strength and we talk about occasionally when we get into the physiology world, tension, and we think tension is strength. Muscular tension and contraction is strength. It is not, it is at minimum 50%. 50%. It is much, much, I mean, at maximum 50%. There are many more factors, including skill level. But in the most rudimentary form, muscles are creating torque. Torque is simply the tension created in the muscle times its mechanical ability. 
which means its relationship to the joint and the bone that it's moving. That constantly changes throughout the range, as does contractile tension. So my point here being that as you move your arm in what we would consider to be a, a, a movement associated with the chest from out to the side to across the front, and there's fancy words for that, but who cares? Trying to describe it, trying to describe it for the listener. Yep. Your strength yeah. changes. Your strength changes. So it makes more sense in terms of efficiency to provide appropriately less weight where you're weaker and appropriately more weight where you're stronger. Otherwise, once again, back example, back exercises are a perfect example. Mm -hmm. A pull down yeah. or a cable pull down or a cable row provides maximum resistance where we are the weakest. That means through the bulk of the range of motion, we are not being stimulated by the load. Nobody in their right mind would grab a weight that they could do 100 reps with and think they're going to get big. Yet we do that all the time through fractions of the range because we choose a weight for a row that if we do it strictly, we can really only finish one end of the range and you could probably do 50 more reps through the bulk of the range. So we've really done what I just said we wouldn't want to do. Mm -hmm. yes. yeah, I'm, not saying, yes. I'm not saying 100 reps is bad. Again, I don't care what you do. Um, I actually, uh, stepping outside of mechanics, I don't subscribe to a certain number of reps as much as I describe to a final rep slash effort relationship. Is it 10 reps or is it 10 reps with a certain degree of challenge at the end? What was the last rep like? And if you threw the last rep, if you threw it around, how inefficient were you? If you cheated on the last rep, you spent the other nine reps working towards that most awesome stimulating rep and you blew it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. Cheating makes it easier. The whole reason to get to failure is to be hard, for it to be more difficult. Why are we so that we you know here's what we do in the fitness industry. We're going, to go, we're going to go in and we're going to walk on the treadmill for 30 minutes and we park in the in the disabled parking closest to the door, 30 feet from the door to go walk on the treadmill for 30 minutes. That's what we do in fitness, right? So I, I'm going to go in and I want to have this hard workout. And then I everything I do, every movement I perform, it appears I'm trying to get out from under the work. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. We think the way to make it harder is to add more weight. Well, there, there we start beating up our joints. What if you performed it in a manner where you actually move the weight that you can move without launching it? And therein, maybe it's maybe it's 75 percent of the weight you can throw around with inertia. And that's that's less weight on your joints while being equally, if not more stimulating. And you're going, wait a minute, less weight stimulating. Listen, you're not lifting the part you're throwing. Yeah, I think that, that's a key lesson for, or you know, key key principle for people to understand there um, that you've touched on, um, Tom. And like, you know, re really invaluable. I think the way you explained it um, with the analogy of the people uh, walking, you know, par parking right next, and it, uh, so they can get on the treadmill. Um, maybe maybe there's a few meatheads that think this that sort of thing doesn't apply to them because they're always loading more weight on the bar and they're hardcore. Maybe now they've kind of they've, the pennies dropped and they realise actually they're, they're doing their equivalent with the. Uh, with them moving a lot of weight from A to B, but a uh, path of least resistance approach to, to getting that rep done. And the key is, I'm not saying go lighter in terms of how hard it is. I'm saying use a weight that still kills you if you want to die. Stop throwing it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Consider this. Now, people can take this wrong easily, but keep it in context of what we're talking about. I find this interesting. I would like for you to compare a reverse grip barbell curl with an Olympic clean and jerk. So could I take 300 kilos and do a reverse curl? No. It is unlikely. And if I could, they would call me Popeye or they would call me arms out of socket. I don't know what they call it. <laughs> <laughs> but consider this. We launched this thing. The skill of launching in the Olympics, in Olympic weightlifting, is, oh my gosh, it's as much skill, if not more, than a, a pitcher who can, who can, you know, not get one hit throughout a baseball game. It is that much skill. If, it was, if they didn't use that skill, they'd get, they would die. Mm -hmm. They'd get crushed. They would not have the ability to move that much weight because they are not actually, and this is going to piss people off, they're not actually that strong. 
Obviously they are. But the way they're moving the weight, the way they're moving it allows them to move 600 pounds. If they moved it differently, they'd have to use less weight. There is a testament to this. They get up to 300 kilos because they're launching it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Does that necessarily mean it's the best thing for hypertrophy? Because we do, I watch people do the exact same thing in the gym all the time. Well, this is the problem. Tom, they think the weight is the key. It's not the weight, it's the stimulus. It's the weight and how it's moved. Yes. So if you if you go to 10 reps to failure throwing it, only partially stimulated through the range because you launched it, or if you go 10 reps to failure, to death, moving it differently so that less weight is required to accomplish that, does the muscle know the difference that it knows 10 reps to failure? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, and that's a generalization and we could pick it apart and get some smart people in here. I am generalizing. It's a podcast. There's no visual here. There's no people as examples. There's no, as you said, who in front of us to, you know, who in quotes, there's no who in front of us to sit back and go, let's play with this. Let's explore this now. Yeah. Should there be yeah. days where you go a little faster? Should there be days where you do more reps? Should there be days? Let's say yes, but who knows? And for all of this we're talking about, I have to go back and qualify. I have to give the disclaimer that if I took you and your twin brother, your exact twin brother, who eat the same things, who sleep the same amount, who have the same amount of emotional distress or lack thereof, Neither of you is getting divorced. Both of you are equally happy in your marriage. Nobody's dog is dying. Everything's exactly the same in terms of, based on those things, hormonal responses. Everything's the same. You work out the way everybody has. Someone else works out the way I'm suggesting. It is, high, it is entirely possible, if not likely, that there will be no visible difference today. The thing I could pretty much guarantee, which means I could probably be wrong, your joints would be different. Mm -hmm. Over time. Well, what does that mean? That means that if you're doing it the way I'm suggesting, you will stay bigger longer. You will be 60 still looking awesome, and your twin brother will be 60 with joint replacements, potentially, and not so big anymore because, well, you know, you can't even do cardio if your knees don't work. Yeah. Much less whatever else. Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. I am getting people to understand that this is speculation. We do not have the studies I just mentioned in problem with exercises. We don't have any study in exercise like I just mentioned, because even if I have twins, there's only certain parts of you that are the same. Your daily lifestyle might not be. And everybody out there taking supplements, taking drugs, taking what, and by the way, I, drugs, not a negative thing to me. I don't care what you do, but everybody taking these things is creating entirely. Why are we doing that? Why is everybody worried about sleep? Why is there? Because we know that the support is key to recovery. And we know key to recovery is choose a percentage key to hypertrophy also. Right. So if those things are not, if those variables are not recognized and intimately controlled in research, the research becomes to some degree invalid. Yeah. Um, Tom, just uh, to interrupt that train of thought there. So I'm just thinking, um, thinking this through so, some of the stuff you said and then, uh, for the listener and, and, and making sure it crystallizes in their mind is it, it seems to me that for what you said we need to understand if we've got our goal we know what our desired adaptation is and then you need to make sure that your training stimulates you know th those adaptations as best best you can and that then takes you into being specific and specificity so like your example um, of the Olympic lifting you know the, the 300 kilos the, the goal of that sport is to lift the most weight possible. So that's you, you go about achieving that. Whereas the goal of uh, hypertrophy is not to know if you can clean and jerk 300 kilos. It's to elicit the, the, uh, the adaptation you want. And then that's how most efficiency plays in. Because once you're very specific about what you're trying to achieve, then again, you can then be very targeted with your exercise selection and your execution of reps. Um, so does, does that kind of, does that make sense? Am I kind of paraphrasing yes. some of those things sure. appropriately and then so another thing that, that sprung to mind well a couple of things uh, actually first thing is your your camera's gone i don't know if you can get that back and then 
if you hit the camera icon, you might pop up in front of me. But currently, was it was I've, it on before? It, it it was earlier, and then it's it's gone. But but you were I didn't want to interrupt. You're in a good flow, so I, it, it's no problem if it doesn't come up. But I thought I'd let you know. Um, so yeah, uh, just just thinking through that. Like, the way I see it is almost every rep is a growth opportunity, and people are doing a lot of wasted reps because, as you say, they're they're throwing the weight, and maybe a large chunk of that range is not effective. So kind of uh, people being more uh, more focused with every single repetition. It's almost as if they have a list of exercises. I've got to get through these. I just move the weight from A to B and I've done three sets of 10 of everything. Tick, I've created a muscle building stimulus. But actually, if, if we give each repetition the respect it deserves, we can be way more efficient and, uh, well, and, and actually effective. I know they're not the same thing, but they, uh, that, that both of those things... Uh, you've just taken a snapshot. That's what's happened. I'm messing with everything okay. right now. All, all sorts my going camera. on. Now is it working? No. You're is not it working? There. No, you're not there now. Because right, yeah. the video, I turned it off and turned it back on. It says it's on, but it's not uh, It's not doing what I want no, it to do. No, like, yeah, just it, the, the icon at the bottom in the middle is the one I think that would get it to work with the camera if you tap that. See if that right. appears. But but no, no, no. Anyway, I can hear you loud and clear, so that's fine. So, so with that in mind, people... Um, they're, then they're, once they get their head around um, the importance of the, you know, the, the, each repetition um, feeding into their goals, it almost seems to me like people, uh, they have the, like, the path of least resistance. You talked about people trying to get out from under. It looks like they're trying to avoid the work. There's almost like this, um, the good and bad on you know, talking to them. Uh, you know, they've got like an angel on one shoulder and actually the angel's telling you to do the hard work and, and suffer, but the, the devil's going, oh, you could just kick this up and you know, you, your leg extension, launch this, you'll get that rep, that 10th rep you need. But actually, they're doing. You're doing yourself a disservice. And and how do we go about have, having that knowledge that you need to try and stay honest and do the work? Now I lost the sound. Ah, right. You're, you're back now. Can you hear me ah, now? There we go. Okay. So so with the knowledge that your body's going to look for you to uh, to avoid work, in, in, or, you know, unless you and you need to be aware of that and, and fighting that urge. How do we go about setting ourselves up uh, to to do the best we can to to not give in to that voice that's uh, that's talking to us obviously the knowledge that you need to to place tension this is exactly the why i mean these are phenomenal and totally appropriate questions for this next progression of the discussion the problem is words are cheap this is why for all of the hundreds of hours of preparatory lecture that I demand for my class, it is all just preparation for the hands-on practical sessions. Because people can study ad nauseum their preparatory stuff, and they walk in the gym, and they look like idiots when they're working out. The ability to apply this stuff, people really, really, really don't sit there with a third eye looking above themselves and go, what am I doing? They, they default to... Part of, what it, part of what they default to is what you said, getting out from under the work. And here's, if there's a couple things to keep in mind. First of all, I ask people often, what's the most important rep? And that's, that's a double-edged sword. That's a, that's a wrong thing. There's two sides to that coin. That's a better uh, um, analogy. Number one, without a doubt, the last rep. It's the hardest for a reason. If someone's doing 10 reps to failure, would anybody argue that the first rep and the last rep are li but liable to be differently stimulating? Mm -hmm. So with that in mind, let me back up and say the most important rep, quite frankly, is the one you're on right now. Yes. So from first rep to second rep to third rep, that needs to be treated like the Olympic Games in and of itself. Each fraction of that rep performed or executed a matter that is the most stimulating, i.e. the most challenging. If we're trying to hit a number, oh, I did my 10 reps. Yeah, but, you know, five of those just flat sucked. I wouldn't even have counted them if you were in my place. So treat each one as an opportunity to get something out of it. The numbers honestly don't matter. We use numbers, Tom, as if they predetermine what we're going to do. 
What we should do is find a load, and I wish there were no numbers on the weight. Find the weight where you can work for a certain period of time until you're, well, progressed up to, to, to your current level of tolerance for, for what the end is. And nobody, if you're training someone, nobody should be dying during their first workout during dumbbell presses. Getting good enough to actually go to a point of failure, nobody, we don't progress that stuff. We think that the end is always the goal. The end is the final goal. It's not the first day's goal. Preparing for someday getting better at the end is the goal. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine someone learning ice skating, and the first day they get out there on the skates, the guy goes, go as fast as you can. Right? Well, we're thinking, well, we're just lifting weights. We don't need to learn anything. Oh, my God. there's That's so wrong. Number Another uh, second thing is when you get to that last rep, as you mentioned, I kind of stopped using the analogy of I, I modify the analogy of the devil versus the angel on your shoulders thing, because what people in class would do when we would work on this last rep and people would be like, oh, my God, it's hard. And your innate self-preservation mindset is get out from under anything hard. That's actually brilliant. We throw things so it's not hard work. Someone who's moving 4,000 boxes a day at FedEx, they need to throw shit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And they're probably throwing the vase you're sending your mom right now and breaking it all over the place. <laughs> but the point is their job, their version of efficiency is get a lot done in four hours, six hours, eight hours. Our version of efficiency is make it as hard as possible in an hour. So those efficiencies are, are seemingly opposite. Get a lot done by throwing a bunch of weight around. No, our version of efficiency is get a lot of stimulation done. And that does not necessarily mean throwing the weight around. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so there's, there's a thing to think about there. But that last rep, what we would say in class is the guy would always, if he was relatively new or sometimes worse than somebody relatively new is someone who's been doing it for 20 years because they it's so ingrained in them the way they perform that last rep it's almost more difficult especially if their mindset is i got to finish the rep at all costs and that's a key phrase because if you're trying to reach a range of motion at all costs, you're going to throw it. Mm -hmm. I'd rather you stop somewhere in between because your muscular failure demanded it. And then maybe we need to change the profile. Then maybe we need to do something to the exercise design so that you can execute it properly. I suggest people don't sacrifice the execution because they built a shit exercise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And usually crappy resistance profiles generate shit exercises in my book. Yeah. So, um, that thing right there. So this guy who wants to throw it at the end, it's like we, I, I've got, okay, there's the, the, um, default cheating guy, the guy that says, I've got to get this body out of work. I got to get it out of the work. So that little guy, and I even got a little plastic guy that looks like a little, uh, it's actually a dog toy, but it has legs on it, little feet, big feet and horns like little satanic rubber red doll. And I set it on top of the machine and I go, are you going to get, you told me you're what you're going to get your goal satisfied. Or are you going to listen to that little fucker up there? Because he's going to win almost every time, unless you go into this going, I refuse to throw this thing. I refuse to get out from under the stimulation. You worked through that whole set to get to the point where your muscles couldn't do what you're trying to do. Why, when you get there, do you try to cheat? Descending sets are a more reasonable way. Changing the profile to be more appropriate is a more reasonable way. From the beginning, we should be doing that. The problem is all these words mean nothing to the, to the listener for the most part. I've got to show them. Mm -hmm. I've got to help them, encourage them, cue them, scream at them, whatever it takes for them to interrupt the default cheating guy. And does that mean that if they went to failure, couldn't move the weight and threw it a little bit at the point of failure, at the point within the range where they failed, that's kind of like spotting yourself. 
That's different than cheating every rep from the beginning. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. There's yes. a difference between yes. doing an extremely strict curl and I absolutely get stuck. And then I start to gently and appropriately try to do things to get it to finish the rep while trying to finish the rep with the muscle, as opposed to the guy who's doing a clean and curl from rep number one with a hundred percent more weight than what he or she should be doing because their crappy performance demands all that weight for no extra stimulation. Mm -hmm. The part they're throwing, they're not lifting. You can't, this is another thing along the lines of the, the parking space, the Olympic lift. If you have 200 pounds, 100 kilos on a bar and you're going to curl it. And you can't curl the 100 kilos. So you cheated. Listen, you didn't get any stronger with the extra weight because you already proved you can only do 100. Mm-hmm. So when you threw it to move more weight, you still only got 100 out of it and maybe less because when you threw it, you relieved yourself of some of the load through inertial effects. So you can put as much weight as you want on there. And as soon as you start throwing it, it's not possible for you to do any more with your elbow flexors than what you did before because that's all they can do. Mm -hmm. The extra weight was your calves and your hips and your low back. And how how does that not make sense to people? Well, I I think... Maybe it does, but they, they, uh, their ego gets in the way quite often. So you know, if you ask them an honest question uh, or, or got an honest answer from them, they, they probably, it does make sense. But, but the, uh, the need to impress their, you know, their friends in the gym or whatever or massage their own ego is perhaps uh, just overriding uh, you know, the, the logical part of their brain. I don't know. Um, well, and also, I think so much of it is in the beginning – we don't know that maybe it's appropriate to do it the way we're discussing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. We don't know that there may be benefit to that. So by the time someone comes along like you or I and says to them, let's try it this way. Well, they're so they're they're they've motor learned this specific skill of throwing it. And as we said before, if you don't stop and say, I'm going to intentionally alter the way I'm doing this. I watch people all the time going, I'm trying, I'm trying to change. It's like, no, you're not. The words say yes. Your mind is still in charge. Let's pretend that the way you're currently doing it is a file. It's a file in your head that every time you walk in the gym and do a dumbbell press, you open that specific dumbbell press file. What we need to do is close that file. Don't even get it out and create a new dumbbell press file. If you lay down and keep doing everything the same way and, and saying you're trying to do it different, Bullshit. You're not. Different has to start from square one. That's eh, just my opinion. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, Tom, I, By the way, I, I keep clicking the video where it says turn it on and it's not even paying attention to me at all. No, just, it's not, not, not interested. No, it's fine. Well, I, we, we, we can hear you. This is only going to go out as audio. So uh, it's, okay. not, it, it's no problem at all. Um, so I, th- I think there's some, some, some uh, great elements there um, and ho- you know, lo- loads of valuable stuff for this. I just want to quickly check something with you. Uh, because uh, technology uh, failed us, my, my and you were there, we were a bit late starting. Are you okay for time at the moment, Tom? We're, so, yeah, I am. Okay, cool. I am. Thank you for asking. Uh, no problem. Um, now, I'd, I'd love if, if, you're, if you're able to, if we could explore back training a little bit because I think it, you, you, you're the sort of the person, certainly in, in my mind, that... Um, has done a great deal to popularize the awareness of resistance profiles, strength profiles, um, and how the relationship between those two can be a key thing for efficiency. Uh, back training presents something of a unique problem to people, even, even if people understand that concept, because I'm sure there's lots of guys, we've talked about similar subjects on this podcast before, they're listening, they could, they could match up a pretty efficient uh, extend, extension pattern, even on isolation exercises, they can um, they can they can match those things up if they know, know how to manipulate things a little bit. But but back training, almost all machines or all free weight exercises we do have horrible um, profiles. So so if someone's thinking, I want to you know completely uh, you know effi- an, eff- an efficient well. How, how can I get around most efficiently training my back for hypertrophy? So it's kind of a, long, a long-winded, open-ended question there, but your, your thoughts on that would be, uh, would be really appreciated. That's an incredibly tough one. Um, and even if someone has a place loaded with machines, and even if they think those machines are phenomenal, I could come in and prove to them those machines suck. Mm-hmm. 
Not because not because machines suck, because whoever's building them doesn't really know what the goal is. Yeah, they are perfectly happy with what they've got. And that's a whole different story. So you can only you can only work with the tools available to you. So let's stick with cables and barbells and dumbbells. Number one, throw out your barbell because you can't match human motion with a barbell. And people go, well, how do you get big without a barbell? Just fine. Thank you. <laughs> um, squats, uh, you know, deadlifts. And, and I would argue deadlifts can be performed better with something else. If your goal is the body, if your goal is powerlifting, you better grab a bar. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, um, you know, that specificity and that's a tough religion oriented religion of barbells belief system right there that people, Oh, I don't know, this guy's an idiot. I was like, I don't care what you think. This is just true. Keep, I'm not saying don't use them, but you know, there's better ways. So, um, the problem with, if I could try to describe mechanics and people are going to, this is a tough one for people. So you put a hundred kilos on the cable row. If you're, and I'm going to go this far, this is a weird thing too. People think an isolation exercise is just a curl, an arm curl. You with me? Mm -hmm. The problem is the most way most people are doing an arm curl. It's not remotely isolation. It's a total body activity. (laughs) Yes. So bullshit on that. Number two, if you were super strict about your arm curl and you held everything else still and performed this perfect arc of motion that elbow flexion could perform, what is it that's keeping everything else still, Tom? The same muscles you were cheating with a minute ago. So the question is never, is it isolated muscle challenge? The question is, are you isolating joint movement away from the other joints that you're working really hard to hold still? So in terms of muscular activity, isolation is a misnomer. Now I'm going to extend that into the row. I really got back to your question into a row. So you're doing a row and you, because of this crummy profile, you're sitting there relatively vertical in your trunk, legs extended forward, feet against something so you can have something to shove against. You got a cable in your hand, hopefully not one of those stupid six inch wide bars that, you know, a neonatal exerciser couldn't use. It's got to be as least as wide as your lats are to get your arms beside your body. I was going to say shoulders, but you got some big folks out there and their shoulder width is not as, as soon as their lats contract, their arms are like, <laughs> they've got something <laughs> bigger to come around. So, um, with your arms extended out straight, that cable is in line with their arms. They're straight, they're straightened arms. At that point, I'm going to tell them they have no resistance. And they're going to go, what are you talking about? I feel resistance. It's hard. Yes, I understand. You feel it in your low back. You feel it between your shoulder blades. You feel it in your hands where you're gripping the handle. And all of those things do have resistance torque against those specific joints and muscles. <clears throat> with your arms being straight and in line with the resistance, There is no challenge to your shoulder muscles and your elbow muscles. There's no way around that. That's why it's easier to have a weight in your arm when you're standing with your arm by your side. If I, because gravity is falling through straight through your arm. If you take that straight arm and hold it out in front of you, there's, you cannot make it more difficult than that because the direction of gravity is perpendicular to your arm. So hopefully everybody can visualize those scenarios. Now, Take that cable that's out in front of us, which is way easier to see as a direction of resistance than gravity is because there's the cable. And as I start to bend my arm, bring my elbows back by my side to do this thing we've historically called a row. Everybody got that visualized, hopefully. That cable is now perpendicular to my upper arm, to my humerus, to the bone to which my lats are attached to. That is the hardest place That is the most resistance in that activity because you went from zero resistive torque at the shoulder to its maximal based upon the length of your arm, uh, upper arm. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. And people will sit there and go, wait, what did you say? The resistance is maximal there. That hundred kilos is still a hundred kilos. Ah, but the hundred kilos is only 50% of the load. It's only 50% of the equation. Again, 10 pounds hanging from my arm and 10 pounds held out front are not the same resistance, are they? Otherwise, you should be able to hold your arm out in front for as long as you could hold your arm by your side. Mm -hmm. Yes. 
Now, how is that not obvious to people? Well, it is. They just never put two and two together. So here's the thing. I'm going to call a cable row an isolated exercise. And people are going to, what, they're, all those joints are moving. Yeah. But in my terms of what's moving and versus what's holding still, both of which are being challenged, if you're not rocking back and forth launching that thing, what are your spinal erectors doing? What are your hip extensors doing? They're working really hard to hold you still instead of working really hard to help launch the weight. When they help launch the weight because you're reaching all the way forward and you yank on that thing, yes, you're able to move more weight, but you're not necessarily providing the stimulation at the end. The reason your brain wants to do that is because it's so dang hard at this shortened all the way arms back by your side end. That's the hardest place. So if you actually had a load that you could get back there and fail there 10 times, the whole rest of the range of motion would not be a challenge at all. So how do we make that a challenge? Well, I would ask to, to, to consider the pull down as a great corollary to that. Now, everybody does a pull down also. And I would also ask them to forget the straight bar on that. Oh, but then how do you get wide? Well, nobody ever told your lats that a wide bar makes you wide and a narrow bar makes you thick. They are unaware of that. It is the direction of resistance that is the key. Is it coming from above or is it coming from in front? So if we grabbed the same bar that allowed your arms to get by your side, you know, relatively wide, they, uh, most gyms now have those bars that are about two feet wide mm -hmm. yes. for, for, for rowing type purposes. Um, and did a pull down with that, with the same ideas, scapular movement involved and, and, but the maximum resistance there is about halfway down. The maximum resistance there where the upper arm is perpendicular to the cable is at the same joint position where you had no resistance in the row. Does that make any mm -hmm. sense? Yeah. Now we're getting towards the idea of complementary exercises and by complimentary, it's the one with the E, not the I. It's not that one exercise says to the other, wow, you look great today. <laughs> it, it completes the stimulation in some manner. And in this case, resistance profile at different points in the range. Why? Because no single direction of resistance can provide optimal stimulation through a joint range that encompasses as much as 180 to 240 degrees, depending upon the person. And that's what the shoulder and sagittal plane can do. So there's some interesting things there. And then, you know, we, there's a dumbbell pullover people have done forever. And then they argue, is it chest or is it lats? Or they don't argue, they just assume. Well, depending on how far you can go into shoulder flexion, i.e. get your arms above your head when you're lying on this bench. If you go far enough, your lats lose mechanical ability. You're, it definitely becomes a chest exercise until your lats can kick, kick back in. The problem is by the time you get your arms over your chest lying on the bench, you have no resistance anymore. But while that can be precarious for your shoulders, it actually completes the resistance profile. I'm not suggesting anybody do that because for the most part, when they do it, they screw it up. They don't go appropriate. They start swinging it, mm -hmm, their butts mm -hmm. moving all over the bench, that kind of thing. And I don't think I've ever mentioned that exercise in any discussion. But if I'm looking purely, forget people's joints, forget the who we're talking about. If I was looking at complementary resistance profiles, those three together make one great exercise. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, some heard, somebody heard me say one exercise. So I go do a tricep not tricep, I go do a tricep, you know, a superset with three exercises, and I go from one to the other, and hey, you can if you want to. Those are just playing games uh, that are fine. But I'm using a mechanical rationale. Now, mm -hmm. quite frankly, that dumbbell pullover thing, there's other substitutes for that, which might be much more reasonable, like a straight arm pull, a straight arm pull down type of thing, where you're Bend over at the hips, make your trunk a little more parallel to the ground with a cable coming from more of above you. So now you've got, again, the cable pulling relatively perpendicular to the arms when they're up by your head. Um, there's, there's lots of options there. In this, this discussion here, I am never recommending exercises because I don't have an individual in front of me for me to look and go, man, your shoulders are not built for that sucker right there. And more will not be better if your shoulder limitation is due to osteophytes slash bone spurs. 
Stretching will not help, it will make it worse. And so, you know, those little rudimentary sound bites of you're limited, so you got to stretch, which is unethical, um, <clears throat> got to go away. But yeah, I'm looking at this purely from an objective mechanical point of view. <clears throat> Can't recommend anything to anybody. The fact that it is objectively reasonable doesn't mean it's individually reasonable. Mm -hmm. And but anyway, it's, what we're talking about here is a thought process. That's what you brought up. Let's think through this back exercise thing. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so that's what we've attempted to do there. And as you mentioned early, early, early on, once somebody gets a little more advanced, well, there's two things that can happen. You mentioned that people start to understand there's principles that really are associated with the things they chose to do. I find that to be a very rare characteristic of individuals that they start to see a theme, that they start to see principles. More often than not, I think they just consider the, they end, they stop. And it be just as a continued belief system rather than, well, I think I've stumbled onto something here besides just an array of exercises that appears to be a magical recipe. Mm -hmm. I think that's where people get stuck. I think all the information out there from social media to Flex Magazine, they all continue to promote and perpetuate that magical recipe mindset instead of the magical recipe being appropriate stimulation through appropriate parts of the range. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, I mean, I, I think for people, they just need to think a little deeper, uh, you know, back training perhaps m requires more than uh, more analysis in, in some respects than, than others, because it's not perhaps so obvious, but the way that you um, can layer things together and they work in, as you say, in a complementary fashion can, can go a long way. Um, and I think partly it's almost having a mindset of um, like an in, intent uh, based programming rather than exercise like uh, based as in opposed to thinking I've got to have these exercises in there just because Flex Magazine told me it's what what's my intention with uh, across this this training session and how can I how can I pair or how can I sequence things to to get that um, that stimulus and and another thing I suppose it part of, and it may go to some ex, uh, I, I get people uh, saying oh I have to I even have to so much more volume for my back to see the, the equivalent growth in, in other muscle groups. And it, it may not be so much that the volume is magic uh, per se. It's just that to get that same magnitude of stimulus takes a, a greater variety, perhaps, is, is the, the way I often, I often thinking about it. And, and, uh, well, well when, you're, when your exercise decisions are based upon, uh, for lack of better words, I'm going to call it happenstance, Meaning you stumbled onto something somebody told you, and wow, they were big, whether it's in spite of what they do or because of it. Correlation and causation are very different things, so we cannot seem to separate in this exercise world. But um, I, without a doubt, what you're saying is true. The big problem is, and this is going to be some self-promotion, we, we have been for decades the only people out there trying to get people to see exercise differently. There was a period of time where... I actually wanted to stop using the word exercise for the reasons you said. We need a different mindset about it. The problem is if you call it fugal binder or whatever, people are going to go, what are you talking about? That's not exercise. So what we really have to do is instead of coming up with a new word, we have to come up with a new mindset. And there's no different. It's really not that different than anything else. You start to realize that just because you use Microsoft Office and pound away in uh, uh, Word, doesn't mean you can build a computer and it doesn't mean you can program Microsoft yourself. Uh, so I would ask people to consider the exercise to be the same way, just because I don't care if they weigh 350 pounds ripped to shreds, just because they've done it and have achieved some degree of success doesn't mean they understand the guts of exercise. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean they can build one that's truly appropriate for the efficiency and effectiveness you and I are talking about. That takes something else than a book. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That takes exercise mechanics, not biomechanics in a sense. It is specific applications of these things and then specific to the individual, going back to one of our original statements, because, you you know, that's another thing I hate about books. That's the thing I hate about trainers and coaches who say who recommend exercises <clears throat> independent of a specific person, independent of evaluating. And this is such a funny thing. The average trainer is so bad at understanding exercise. If you say, give me a, what's an assessment to evaluate the range someone should go through on a bench press if someone was to, for better or for worse, choose a bench press. And the first thing they do is they look around because we have canned assessments, canned assessments. So they go, what's an assessment I know? Oh, it's either sit and reach or it's an arms overhead squat. 
which one of these things is best for the bench press? Well, that, that's, the, that's an example of the ignorance generated by our industry. You better do something that looks like a bench press with virtually no weight if you want to figure out your viable range for a bench press. And so every single thing we're doing, how much shoulder flexion does a person have if you're trying to do a pull down? And pretty much you're going to see nobody can do a pull down behind the neck because it's not available in their joints and more will not be better there. So that's a, learning those kinds of things, learning directions of resistance. We've been teaching at RTS forever. And I think you mentioned Michael. Mm-hmm. Yes. And he's, a, yes. he's a phenomenal teacher. He's far more patient than I am. <laughs> um, but coming to see those things, choosing to commit to thinking differently and learning something beyond um, what is the norm is is the key there. And I really have never found anybody that was able to do it on their own. And I haven't found it. There's a lot of wannabes now. There's a lot of people on the internet. They're saying they're the best. And they stumbled onto this three years ago or five years ago. And they're going, I have all this experience. And they say things like, I see all these people that X, Y, and Z. And I'm like, dude, you're not old enough to have seen all those people. If you saw somebody one time, if you trained them online, if you saw them for a week, you have no idea what you're doing with that person nor their response. You've got to train someone for 10 or 15 years to see the outcome of what you're doing, both positive or negative to them. And so the vast majority of people out there in the world in general, and certainly in exercise, are such short-term investors. They don't ever really know what's going to happen with someone. They don't think long-term. They don't think of exercise as something you want to pay dividends. They're looking for a get-rich-quick scheme. Those always fail in the end because that's the mindset of someone. So the next, even if they get rich, they're going to lose it next time around. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, so that I'm going to promote for your world over there, Michael and his education. Um, Even if someone has no desire to be a trainer, he's great at presenting it just for insight and to help you see where we're going with this, to help you see that achieving a range at any cost is not actually achieving the range in a stimulating manner. Mm -hmm. Yes. Those kinds of things. Absolutely. Yeah, so, uh, well, just to jump in there, I can uh, fully support uh, you know, that um, investing in Michael and, and learning from him. It's been, well, if you're over in the UK, uh, I'm currently studying under him. We've had him on as a guest on the show, and uh, he's, he's excellent, a, a fantastic teacher, as you correctly identify. Um, yeah, and, and he has a way better, way better British accent than I. Yeah, <laughs> he's got he's got a be- he's got a better one than me as well. Um, so so uh, yeah, he's got he's got that, those northern tones. I just I just sound like something out of Lock, Stock and Two Smoking Barrels, apparently. But anyway, he, yeah, he's excellent. So uh, for anyone who's listening, who based in the UK, um, you know, Michael's at Integra, and he's he's one of the um, instructors on RTS over here as well, correct? Um, and then yes. obviously over. Over your, uh, your your way, you're you're the guy to come and see. I believe you're in Oklahoma, right? I am, and we're starting to ramp back up again with classes. And the thing I'm planning to do for those is actually 50% easily for my level of teaching, um, historically called the mastery version, which really uh, because we're going to go beyond what we were teaching. It's just it's called RTS three right now. The bulk of our students come from international um, sources, mm-hmm. so. A lot of people from the UK, Australia, you name it, and um, South yes. America. But uh, my goal as we ramp back up, if people I demand now as a prerequisite for people to go to, we've eliminated, there were originally five classes in my mastery stuff, two of which were largely, if not entirely, lecture. Well, anybody can, you know, sit on your toilet and listen to a lecture. You don't need to fly across the pond. So. Having all these lectures now, quite frankly, in a a far expanded fashion, because I don't have the limitation of days of a course to present online. So on exerciseprofessional.com, I've had the opportunity to present these things in 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 a evolved and much more expanded fashion. I demand that people come to those so we can actually have a conversation when they get here. Because that's the biggest problem with communication. Everybody wants to talk about exercise in an, in an advanced manner, and they do not have the details of exercise mechanics in their mind in order to do so. So just as I was attempting to explain torque, um, that's even difficult when people see it on a video. It's But without that, we can't talk about resistance profiles. We can't talk about strength profiles. So these things have to become a second language, if you will. But then... Because that portion, as well as the 
joint mechanics, muscular mechanics, that stuff is now on there also. We're able to just boil everything down to the practical sessions, to getting people in the gym and saying, let's build an exercise for you. Let's work on the skills of execution. Mm -hmm. Now let's take mm -hmm. her and see what differences we're going to run into. Because that same exercise may not look remotely the same. In fact, we may have to back off, although that exercise is the end goal. We might have to do a couple of things before that because of her current motor challenges, joint challenges, et cetera, et cetera. So my goal, long story made too long, is to potentially stream together into about seven days instead of three weekends because of the stuff, you know, the lectures are already, those two weekends are gone. But I think I can take the three, what would have been, you know, 12, 13 days and put it down to about seven days if everybody does their homework online. Mm -hmm. So that would be cool because now instead of all these flights, you guys are flying one time. Nobody in Europe works during the month of December anyway, so you might as well come <laughs> over here, right? So you know, it is, it's very true. Not, uh, and I'm based in in London. Uh, well, uh, normally nothing happens in August over here. So if you're trying to uh, trying to attract um, and, you know trainers from London over. The, the the city almost shuts down in August. All the traders and lawyers disappear off because it's school holidays. So uh, so trainers don't have many clients around. That's another another good time to to get us. Good tip. Good um, tip. So yeah, um, well that that sounds fascinating uh, and, and and well worth investigating. Also, I, I assume they're still up there. But you have a ton of videos on YouTube, which if people are wanting to start dip their toe in the water, get a feel for things, assuming they're still there, they're they're a great entry level for people if they if, if this these concepts are new to them. Are those videos still all up? They are, yeah. and I, I try to get people to understand that those are not <clears> – <throat> you, you, you saying it as dip your toe in the water is a perfect way to mention it because people get in there, and, and I've had people email me and say, oh, I've seen everything you have on video, and I'm like, really? <laughs> yeah, everything on YouTube. I'm like saying, you know, saying you've seen all my stuff on YouTube is kind of like going to Steven Spielberg and, Steven Spielberg and saying I've seen every commercial for every movie you've ever made. It's like, yeah, that's awesome. You should check out the movie. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's, I like that. I like that. Yeah, um, a, a great analogy there. So uh, exerciseprofessional.com, we'll get people to check that out. Um, RTS as well, if people Google that, I mean, it's not that complicated. Give it a Google. You'll find your way uh, to these places and, and start uh, start learning more. Well, the website's easy, rts123.com. There you go. Pretty easy, simple. Easy yep. peasy. Easy. We'll, we'll make sure we got those in the, in the show notes. Um, for, for people to get access. Tom, um, you've been very generous with your time today, um, so I don't want to take up too much more. Before you go, though, I do have a, um, a couple of short questions for you. One is, if I could interview anybody next, um, if you know, I have access to um, contact book of everyone around, who should I interview next? Regarding what topic? Well, um, well let's Cause go. I, I was, I was going to say Margot Robbie, but I don't know really what you're looking for here. Well, I mean... Yeah, I, I, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm up for that interview. We'll definitely have to make sure the camera was working for that for that one. Uh, it, it'd be wasted just audio, right? But um, uh, and then we'll, well, okay, we'll go with a someone in the sort of fitness space. Um, you know, so any any anyone that springs to mind in there who'd be uh, an exceptional invite as well. Wow, there's a long list in my mind, and um, <clears throat> here's my problem with answering that. I, I have a list of people that have a lot of history in this industry that I find incredibly interesting because that's where we start to learn where things came from. And for all the kids out there today, and I mean everybody 30 and under, everybody runs around thinking they've got something new. It's old. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's just a new twist. Listen, it's just the reincarnation of bell bottoms from the 60s, man. It's not new. And it doesn't mean it's any better. In fact, often... Our latest version is so dumbed down, it's worse than ever. So uh, <clears throat> it usually has a fancier name. And sometimes if it's an exercise, it has an Eastern Bloc name. So if it's Romanian, Bulgarian, or anything like that, it's really super cool. When in fact, it's yeah. just an, an itty-bitty variation on deadlift. But anyway, where I was going with that, there's so many people that from the equipment world that I've known for 40 years, so many people from amazing guy, Tom Dieters, who was editor-in-chief of Muscle and Fitness and watched all that evolve. And um, and he's been retired from there for a long time. But he his scope and understanding is an entirely different perspective. Now, I don't know, is regarding someone to actually say, here's some specific advice for your listeners. I don't even know where to start. Mm -hmm. I don't even know where to start. I think you may have talked to, um, on Instagram, it's hypertrophy coach, but there's a guy named Joe Bennett. Yeah. 
Yeah, I haven't haven't had him on yet, but he, he's a that's he a good. He is so chat. so articulate. He's so level headed. His perspective is is uh, he's so down to earth. Do you know what's uh, what, what's funny with Joe? Like I've seen his stuff. Right, it is you're right. He's very articulate, but yet he tries to make you think that he is not. So, some some he's all, almost say, oh, so I'm I'm just a dummy and I can't I I can't think this through. And then he'll reel off, yeah, you know, this perfect description that just makes it so simple. <laughs> But it, it, it's, it's sophisticated in its delivery because actually the concept he's giving you isn't simple, but he makes it simple. Well, the beauty of that, one of the reasons I appreciate that so much, because the vast majority of our industry, especially on social media, is the exact opposite, the polar opposite, right? They don't know anything, but my God, they want you to think they're smart. So, yeah, he is one of my uh, he is one of my heroes in that respect. Mm -hmm. And um, I would almost say that... Uh, Although he's from Florida, I think no Pennsylvania or something like that. He uh, he he could be from Oklahoma with that attitude. <laughs> we would let him back. <laughs> All right, he gets the seal of approval. All right, well I'll I'll make sure to reach out to Joe, try and get him on. I think that's a that's a really good um, recommendation, Tom. Uh, appreciate that. Um, all right, last question from me, which is one that new, normally stumps people. So just to get to know our our guests a little better, is there something? Can you tell us something about you that we probably don't already know? <clears throat> yeah, I can tell you something that I had forgotten until the other day. Yeah. So I had an employee one time who adopted a kid from from uh, Russia. She goes over, she gets the kid, she brings the kid back, names the kid Noah. And she goes, hey, I would love on the wall of his room to have a big mural of, you know, like Noah's Ark and the animals and that stuff. And I said, well, give me some kids books with some pictures. So I took those kids books and I painted a floor to ceiling, wall to wall, actually across two walls, mural of Noah's Ark. I had two of almost every animal that was in the book. So although I think there was only one whale and I'm not sure a whale was actually on the boat, but maybe he was just like <laughs> under the boat. Anyway, that's, yeah, I can, uh, <clears throat> while I may not be a great original artist, I can steal other people's stuff pretty well <laughs> uh, yeah 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 I, well, I can sympathize with that i uh, i enjoy sketching and uh, and that sort of thing but but i've got no creativity i can i can copy something quite nicely but if you ask me to create something i don't have that in my locker but that's that's uh, that's amazing and tell you what i yeah no no one knew that i don't think no one saw that one coming so that's uh, that's a nice little insight um all right tom thank you so much for your time today it's, it's been a pleasure uh, loads of value there for, for the listeners um, you know I'd love to at another another time when uh, when available get you on and uh, talk about a few uh, few other things uh, pick that brain of yours that that would be fantastic but for now uh, thanks so much for taking the time um, and we'll speak to you soon you're, you're very welcome I enjoyed it it was my pleasure that wraps up today's episode thank you so much for investing your time with us we really appreciate it if you enjoyed what you heard and took value from it, please do me a favor by heading to iTunes right now, subscribing to the show and leaving a review. Positive reviews, you know, like five stars, hint, hint, really help the ranking of the show and will help us to spread the word and keep getting top class guests on. Make sure to follow Breaking Muscle on social media and me at Tom McCormick, that's T-O-M-M-A-C-C-O-R-M-I-C-K, on Instagram. Bye for now, and I'm looking forward to catching you on the next episode of the Breaking Muscle podcast.